Paul Churchland, uh, he's not just grabbing that out of thin air. The, this, the, the words we use to describe brain, mind, emotion, passion, you've paid a lot of attention to, as, as has Pat. What about you're, you're hoping for a change in vocabulary? I almost think you, you do anticipate novels where brain chemistry moves in instead of passion, emotion, love, etc., well, Colin's skepticism uh, is uh, certainly uh, salutary, uh, and he may well be right, uh, but um, if there are changes in the way that we all come to speak about one another and think about one another, if those changes do come, they will come because they earned their way into our common vocabulary, because they gave us a better grip on what's going on inside us. Uh, I don't have an enthusiasm here uh, for replacing ordinary uh, mental uh, vocabulary with a scientific vocabulary just because one's scientific. Uh, I suspect that our ordinary vocabulary perhaps hides as much as it reveals. Words it like what? I, I threw some out, but I don't know if I've got the right ones. What, what are some potentially... Well, um, oh, a big worry here concerns something we can all agree on, and Colin will, uh, will agree on this too. Uh, perhaps the most important way in which we represent one another's rep uh, uh, mental lives is in terms of the beliefs we have and the desires we have and the hopes and the fears that we have. And to identify the hopes and fears, we uh, specify them with a sentence. You hope that uh, your children will grow up healthy. You uh, fear that there'll be another storm this winter. And uh, here you specify something something with a sentence. Now, human talk in the marketplace and over the mm. dinner table assumes that these uh, sentential states are extraordinarily important. Indeed, um, most people think of one's mental life as a, an internal dance of sentences of one kind or another. Well, more than that, now, I mean, if you talk about taking away belief, hope, fear, desire, that, that <laughs> sounds like the very stuff of life. You'll have dukes in, in, up. In, uh, indeed so. But, of course, the, the worry is not that we don't have an inner life. Uh, we certainly do. The worry is, are we conceiving of it in the right way? And the worries start to accrue when you realize that m a mental life is something that's shared with many other creatures on the planet, golden retrievers and kitty cats and horses and whales and uh, so forth. They all have a rich mental life, but none of them uses language. Indeed, humans don't use language until they're almost two years old. And even if you have a, a form of brain damage called global aphasia mm. on the left side, which mm. completely knocks out your capacity for processing sentences of any kind, you're still a conscious creature. You're still uh, uh, wise. You're still loving, you're still insightful, you oh, 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 still... Okay. But I have to ask then, if, if you say this language it may be primitive, it may uh, obscure as much as it reveals, if you take it away, doesn't it... It's, it seems as though we, we, we're like animals. Are, are we uh, not, not making robots more human, worry, but humans but more robots? We're not going to take it away. Uh, the guess is that a new vocabulary will emerge from the growing sciences, which will prove to be more useful even over the dinner table and in the marketplace. And uh, we won't stop talking about our mental lives. We'll just be talking about it in a language that's much more penetrating than the one we currently use. Let me give you an yes, example. Mm -hmm. I think that we used to think of memory as being one sort of major single kind of thing. And neuroscience has now shown us that there are a number of very different memory systems. And what has become part of the normal vocabulary of ordinary people is the distinction between their episodic memory on the one hand, where they remember such things as what they had for breakfast, and skill learning or procedural memory on the other hand. This is just part of how people think now. People didn't used to realize that there was a big difference between deep sleep and what we call REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, or dreaming sleep. That's just part of the normal vocabulary of the way people talk now. They talk about their REM periods versus their deep sleep periods. So we'll, we'll begin to subset so, belief, desire, hope, fear, I have this or that kind of... Uh, well, predicting exactly how we're going to come to think about those sorts of representations, including the representations or the, the motives that come from the emotions, how that's going to change remains to be seen. The change may be little, it may be very substantial. 
Um, but the idea of change in and of itself, I think, is often, when the change is explanatorily mm -hmm. useful, mm -hmm. it gets right into the vocabulary. It, it, but, but if we take away the, the poetry, that. even if it's crude poetry... Nobody wants to take away anything. I mean, novelists well, should I, keep I mean, writing I, the way... But, you know, there are novelists who are picking up on, on these sorts of things and are now writing stories based on what the novelist has learned. Tom, about Tom let me give you an example yes, of, of something that happened to Pat and me uh, mm. to illustrate that uh, such language may end up displaying a poetry of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, this happened um, oh, a, a couple of years ago, actually. Uh, I was at home at the end of the day making dinner because Pat was at an, a, a meeting of the chairs and the chancellors, and they were confronting some long problem, and the meeting ran right, late, yep, and yep. she came home, and... Uh, uh, I said, hello, dear, as she came through the door. And she said, oh, Paul, don't talk to me. My brain is awash in glucocorticoids. My dopamine levels are at rock bottom. My serotonin system isn't working at all. My amygdala is uh, a, a fire. No, if, no, it wasn't for my, if it wasn't for my endogenous opiates, I'd have driven the car into a tree And, on you're, the and you're posing this as poetry for us. This is what uh, will be poetry. Well, well, you're 2020. She, she, that, she, she then said, my dopamine levels need raising. Pour me a Chardonnay. I'll be down in a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Now, now, <laughs> uh, okay, I, I get it. And, and it, you know, may, maybe we're cavemen and women compared to what will, will come later. Maybe uh, glucocorticoids or whatever it was you said, Paul, you said turns right. into poetry. But, but I don't know. Listeners, what do you think? Art is calling from East Lansing, Michigan. Art, you're on the air. Yeah, hello. Uh, boy, I love hello. this uh, conversation you have. Um, I think we really need to explore and learn to... Um, extend our reach and our amazing potential and uh, overcome a lot of our limitations and better human life and that's what you all are doing my concern is attacked by the religious community i see that uh... their huge franchise uh... they may feel threatened and as we saw the history with galileo um, their huge uh... very powerful propaganda reach can be brought to bear on um on this research, but are, 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 are you so things. sure? What, what if what if it turns out that uh, somehow belief, even in mechanical terms, uh, has a real salutary effect on I don't know the human bi biology, mind, and our spirits? That'd be amazing. I'm just <laughs> concerned because you see what's happening with Darwin and evolution and yep. their attack for there, um, and and it's possible that something good can come out of it in that area. But I'm. Uh, I'm concerned that they uh, they like to say no and they like to stop. Well, I'll ask you about that, but I read you're in bioscience. Do you agree with the, the direction the churchlands are pointing for our understanding of consciousness? Art? Oh, do I? I'm sorry. I thought you were asking your uh, guest there. Um, I think that uh, they, <laughs> they're very conservative. They want us to regress back to the past. I don't see that they welcome any science. Uh, they see it as a threat. Who, who's the they you're talking about? You're, you're back to well, the... I, I know it's very vague, but and this is just a concept, okay? Yeah. Um, is that they have seen the expansion of science in recent decades, and a lot of the media portrays science as scary science fiction and how it's harming man, like That's look a, at nuclear energy. Right, hey, so you're, you're talking about the religious that. community as well. Of course, there are many faces to that, but Pat and Paul... How about it? Are you going to be the new Galileos, you and your well, ilk? Oh, uh, dear me, I hope not. Uh, Galileo did suffer a bit towards the end, yep. uh, thanks to the intransigence of the church. But my, my first impulse is to make common cause with the uh, religions of the world. If we can uh, figure out how to make a, an infant's uh, childhood better and more effective, if we can learn how to expand the role of a healthy conscience in people's lives, if we can expand the degree to which uh, humans embrace one another and are patient and trusting and so forth, uh, then I don't think we'll be at odds with the church. Quite the reverse. We'll be uh, helping them to do at least part of their traditional job. 